the five arts of intimacy. This is a very different sort of message, but I say that almost every week, so the words sort of lack any credibility after a certain amount of time. Uh, I don't think God has ever given me uh, normal messages. I feel like they're always a bit abnormal. But this is a very unique one for me personally, and I have a hunch it'll be very unique for you as you appropriate it. By the way, every message that I would deem uh, worthy of our time, our attention, our focus, has to lead us to Jesus and his work on the cross. And so you'll see that this message will ultimately aim right to that. Five arts of intimacy. Intimacy is... One of those things that I think every single one of us knows the value of, some of us, especially as men, have a natural sort of chuckle and abrasion that we have just in our soul towards the notion, because women are all after intimacy. And, you know, we as men, you know, we're fine, you know, just sort of lone ranger in it. And so, yeah, we want to get married, and yes, we do want certain pleasures in marriage, but intimacy might be a little overboard. Well, that's the non-Christian man. The Christian man truly knows the value of intimacy at multiple levels. Because as we go through this message, you're going to see that it does apply to marriage. And yet, what is marriage all about in Scripture? It's all about Jesus and his bride, which is the church, which is us, as strange as that is, even for us men. It's like, huh, bride? And yet, that is the revelation in Scripture. So the five arts of intimacy, this is going to literally be the framework or the recipe for how intimacy is gained. And so it does help if you have a positive notion towards the concept of intimacy. Otherwise, I have to spend half the message just trying to convince you that it's important. So if you jump on board in the beginning and go, okay, yeah, 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 we do need intimacy. You see, without intimacy, you'll notice that every relationship will break down. You can have a certain form, it's like a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. You can have a form of marriage, but deny intimacy. And what you have is an empty marriage. You could have a business relationship in your marriage, but you must have intimacy. Otherwise, you'll begin to notice a deterioration. Intimacy is almost what keeps something healthy, strong, vibrant, and growing. In our relationship with Jesus Christ, you take the word intimacy, and if you remove intimacy from the framework of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you have head knowledge of Jesus, you do the right things, you dot the right I's, cross the right T's, and yet you lack closeness and nearness with the living God, and you know what? You're actually not that healthy. And so what we are interested in is the, the impetus in the relationship, the life. It's like you could have a shell of a seed without the pith of the seed in it. You could have the husk. But if you don't have the life-giving substance in the innermost part of it, what do you really have? You plant it in the ground, it's not going to grow. We're, we're after the life. And the life is intimacy. Intimacy. Drawing near with perfect confidence. Now, most of us are going to default to physical relationship. Okay? And I'm not going to try and uh, dissuade you from that. Because I don't mind you going in that direction first. You know, in a marriage, in a relationship, even before marriage, as, this, as the seeds of intimacy are even being planted, there can be, because of hurts and past misunderstandings that we've had, for instance, if you've been abused by a man, it is very difficult for a woman to open herself up to a man. Very difficult because there has been a hindrance or a hurt that has been established. And so intimacy is drawing near with perfect confidence. You have a complete trust, and you have a sense that you are going to be well cared for, and as a result, you make yourself open in a relationship. Now, if you know where this message is ultimately going to go, because every message that is worth its salt has to go to Jesus, you're going to see drawing near with perfect confidence. Some of us fail to draw near under the throne of grace because we lack the perfect confidence that either God wants us there, that God has accepted us, that his blood is efficacious for us personally. We're probably the exception. And so as a result, we do not have confidence and we recoil. Though the invitation is there and though doctrinally we know it's there, personally, we cannot accept it. 
And so as a result, though others around us may be drawing near, we don't draw into that intimate place. So intimacy, drawing near with perfect confidence. I'm going to break down the concept of intimacy as we start. I'm going to basically break it down into three component parts, which we will see come back into play at the end of the message. The first one is nearness. Intimacy, by its most basic definition, would be nearness or closeness. Nearness, closeness, admission into the sacred. There is a dimension of your existence that is not just obvious to the world around. It's the intimate aspects of who you are. It's the nearest parts to your soul. And so those are things that in any wise person, and there's a principle of modesty, which means to cover up the sacred dimensions of your life with clothing, but then there's a, an issue of soul modesty, where you cover up the intimate dimensions of your soul. You don't just bear them for all to see. These are fears, dreams, desires, longings. They're an intimate, very near and dear dimension of who you are. Well, this is admission into those sacred dimensions. An otherwise prohibited territory. Whereas, hey, hey, you're, no one's allowed in here. And then suddenly one person comes along in your lifetime, and you find yourself saying, you're welcome to come in. It's intimacy. Okay, number two, affectionate friendship. The healing of all hurts. If, if you've ever had a relationship with someone, like say a family member, a spouse, a child, or maybe it's your parents, you know, whichever direction you want to look at, it's a very important relationship in your life, but because of hurt, because of a strain in the relationship, maybe misunderstanding, you do not have intimacy. You're not close to them. There is no nearness there. There isn't a confidence in coming near. There isn't a desire to open up and say, oh, I want to share this with you too because you mishandled the last thing I gave you as a trust. And so intimacy is also an affectionate friendship, which means all the hurts have been healed. There is no more impediment. The removal of all impediment, the complete restoration of all trust, no barrier, no restriction, no wall of separation. So whereas there may have been a wall of separation, intimacy is a declaration that that wall of separation is no more. And it's a declaration even to the other person to say, look, I recognize that I've been holding you at arm's length. Well, I want you to know that there's no barrier now. And I want you to have access into my life. And I just want to say, let's do this right from this point forward. Let's start establishing a healthier communication. Okay? Number three, sharing the inmost, revealing that which is inward or innermost. And so these are the three dimensions, nearness or closeness, affectionate friendship, and then sharing of the inmost. In other words, you really don't have intimacy if that which is in the innermost of you, the most precious dimensions of you, you refuse to give. In other words, you have someone in your life, you're like, oh no, we have intimacy, and you're getting all the inmost from them, but you're not sharing the inmost from you. Well, guess what? That isn't intimacy. You're canceling something out in the process because you are not sharing the inmost. There's a need for deep unto deep, back and forth, a depth of givenness from both sides, and that is what intimacy is. Okay, so that's just a very quick overview. I don't know if you guys are prepared for this message, but this one, uh, this one just cuts to the quick fairly quickly. The land of Havilah. You guys remember uh, Genesis? It talks about the land of Havilah. There's four streams that come forth out of Eden, and the first one goes through the land of Havilah. And what's weird about the Bible in this point, because the Bible only says that which is important, but it mentions the land of Havilah, and it mentions something that the land of Havilah has in it. I'm going to read to the scripture. Well, the, my subtitle, the land of shimmering golden beauty. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that, it is, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and there is bdellium and onyx stone. You know the other three uh, rivers, they mention where they go, but they don't mention anything about the land. But we know about Havilah, and in Havilah, the gold is good. This is something that you know as a Christian when you read through Genesis so many times. Because how many times we start the Bible and our read through the Bible campaign, we're like, I'm going to read through the Bible. So we've read this scripture, oh, I don't know, 70 times in our life. We should be ex excellent on the fact that in the land of Havilah, the gold is good. 
the gold mine. Now listen to this subtitle. This is very, very important. It starts with a gift, a promise, and a commission. It starts with this. Okay, now this doesn't make any sense to you yet. I'm going to give you a little metaphor here. Because what I'm going to describe to you is somewhat difficult to wrap your arms around spiritually. It's like, what? I know it. I need it, but how do I get it? So I'm going to liken intimacy to a gold mine. But the intimacy isn't the gold mine. The intimacy starts with the gold mine, which is a gift, a promise, and a commission. How you handle that gold mine defines if you have intimacy or not. Now, follow me on this. This is a letter written to me from my father, not my earthly father, my heavenly father. And I'm just going to walk you through this. He has given me something. It starts with a gift, and then a promise, and then a commission. My son, Eric. Herein lies the deed to the Havilah gold mine. It's yours. 100% yours. Whoa. Could you imagine getting that in the mail? Your, your father dies and you receive the gold mine of the land of Havilah? Wow. Uh-huh. Look at I have it written down right there. It's mine. Herein lies the deed to the Havilah gold mine. It's yours 100%. Remember, it starts with a gift. Then, a promise. This mine is guaranteed to yield. Though at times it may appear to have run dry. In other words, there's no more gold. I can't find it in here. I got a mine, but I don't see any more gold. I promise you that there will always be a fresh vein of gold to follow. You must look for it. Study it. Get to know it. And never, and I mean never, will you go without if you seek gold, you shall find gold. This mine will certainly reward you if you diligently seek its riches. Starts with a gift, then with a promise. If you don't have the gift, well, guess what? You're not going to get the gold. If you get the gift but don't have a promise, so say you have a, a gold mine but you have no promise associated with it, then when you stop seeing the gold flex, and you're like, I, I think it's run dry. Guess what? You'll give up. But there's a promise that comes with this one. And who gave the promise? Your heavenly Father who cannot lie. So when he gives the gift and then he gives the promise, you have the start of something great. But we're all rather lazy at heart. And so in comes the commission. You are penniless and unable to support the high calling you've received on your own earthly salary. You see, Eric has a high calling bequeathed to me from my Father in heaven. Saying, Eric, this is what I commission you to do. And then in my own reasoning, I say, okay, well, my earthly salary will be able to pull this off, won't it? No, there's a reason why I gave you that gold mine, Eric. You are actually penniless and unable and ill-equipped to be able to carry out the great commission I've given you. So therefore, I didn't just give you a gift and give you a promise. I'm giving you a commission because I know how you work, Eric. You're going to look for the easiest way to accomplish the task. And I'm going to tell you up front, your default solution will fail you, which is why I gave you the gift and gave you the promise with the gift. And it's why I have to give you the commission. Because otherwise, you would default to your own earthly salary as the means of accomplishing my commission. You are penniless and unable to support the high calling you've received on your own earthly salary. I understand this. And therefore have bequeathed you this mine as the means of financially supporting the gargantuan assignment I have given you. As your father, I heartily exhort you, even command you, to not take this mine for granted, nor to forsake its great wealth. Mining is difficult work. Okay, now remember what our theme is here. Don't get distracted by the fact that I'm talking about a gold mine. You see, there is a gift that has been given us, and a promise with that gift, and a commission. And the commission is, do not take this for granted. You've been given something precious, but what is necessary? Remember what I said, if you handle the gift, the promise, and the commission correctly, then out of it will come forth the theme of this message, intimacy. Everything that is truly desired, everything that is needful will flow out of rightly handling that which we've been entrusted. However, most of us don't handle that which we've been entrusted very effectively. 
Mining is difficult work, and therein lies the main reason we do not handle it very effectively. This is hard. Mining? Why do I have to mine? Why can't you just leave me an inheritance of a whole bunch of gold chunks in the bank? Why did you have to stick it in a mine? I mean, you're God. <laughs> he could have done that. Instead, he stuck it in a mine, and it's hidden behind walls of granite. And I have to, I have to work for it. I have to labor for it. I have to study. I have to give myself in a dark hole. Oh, you cannot do it any other way. I have, God has given us something, but it came in the package that doesn't necessarily fit our natural bearing. We, we just got the mind of Havilah, and yet we still nitpick it and wish it could have been something different. Everyone else is penniless on planet Earth without even the mind. We have the mind. We have no excuse except the fact that it's hard work. Mining is difficult work, and no doubt there will be times in which you desire to see if your own measly paycheck can sustain you. I assure you now that it will not and never will be able to. So quit yourself like a man, Eric, and go to work. If you heed my directive and embrace this high calling, you will have riches to spare. I'm eager, this is my father speaking to me, I'm eager to witness how you steward this grand gift I've entrusted you. Your beloved father, Abba. Now, I can get mad at that and say, why'd he, why'd he leave me that with a commission too? Now I have to do it, otherwise he gets mad at me? He's not looking for a reason to get mad at you. He's given you everything you could possibly need. Now, most of us understand at the very outset that that would be quite the gift. I just want you to know, just spiritually speaking, what you received is far better than any gold mine that we could ever translate into this natural realm. And I mean that. Far, far, infinitely greater than any gold mine. When we finally begin to swallow the grandeur of what God has given us, we start to wake up to the value of it, and we do not treat it with contempt. How many of us as men in here have a gold mine in our own home, in our wife? And we have failed to fully take advantage of its beauty and its luster and its grandeur. And when things got hard, we looked to our own paycheck, our own ability to lead a home instead of to the power of what Jesus Christ has given us, to be able to mine out of that marriage the beauty and the glory that can only come from heaven. The five arts of gold mining. Converting glorious possibilities into heavenly realities. If you have a gold mine, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you actually have any gold. To get the gold, I mean, technically you own the land where the gold is, so you have access, legal access, deeded access to the gold. So yes, technically it is yours, but to fully function in the strength and the wealth and the virtue of that gold in our natural realm, you must mine it. So, the five arts of gold mining. Remember the name of this message? The five arts of intimacy. This is the five arts of gold mining. Okay, it's going to seem like a distraction and a, like we're going off course, but bear with me here. Converting glorious possibilities into heavenly realities. So you have all sorts of possibilities with a gold mine. That doesn't mean you have the realities of the gold yet. So what you must do is you must have the arts of mining firmly in place and activated on a daily basis, you must exercise them. If you do not exercise the arts of gold mining, guess what? No gold. It doesn't matter that you own the land, that you've been deeded the territory. If you do not cultivate that territory, if you do not labor within that territory, no gold. It's that simple. So number one, time dedicated inside the mine. Can't get around this. We want to invent a robot who will go down into the mine and spend time for us. It's like, how much time do I need to spend? That's the first indication that you don't appreciate the gold mine, right there. Are you saying I actually need to go down into the mine? You see, you don't understand the value of that mine, do you? You don't understand the value of that gold outside of that mine. You don't recognize what was deeded to you. You've been given everything you need, and even the commission from your heavenly Father has said, you can't do it outside of this. That's why I gave it to you. So when you start complaining about time spent, you recognize that something's a little distorted even in the beginning. 
Number two, finding the veins of gold. So it's not just time spent. Like we're just going down there and it's like, okay, you need to have an hour in the mine every day. You know how many of us spend our time with our wife this way and time with our God this way, time with our kids this way? Pacing back and forth, it's like looking at the clock and finally the alarm goes like, ding! We're like, oh, all right, we're done. What good does it do to be in a mine passing time? Did you get any gold out of that mine because you were in the mine? No, you need to be in the mine and then you need to follow up with art number two, which is finding the veins of gold, which by the way is labor. You have to study, you have to observe, you have to see things, you have to have your eyes open, you have to have one of those little lamps on your head and be looking around and that's hard work. Oh, but guess what? If you are in the mine and if you begin to study and see the gold, guess what? You are one step closer to actually gaining the reality of that gold in your life. But imagine that we spend time in the mine and we find out where the veins of gold are. Ah, there's a vein. Uh Uh-huh, there's a vein. And we stop there. We come out and someone says, did you see the veins of gold? Absolutely, I saw the veins of gold. Well, where's the gold? Wait, you expect me to do something with the veins of gold? You better believe it, we do. You're a miner. So it's not just being in the mine, and it's not just seeing the veins of gold. It's doing something about the veins of gold. You're not just seeing it so you can stare at it, you're seeing it so you can go after it. There it is. When you see gold, it's a moth to a flame. You go right after it, and God has given us tools in our mining so that we can actually extricate the gold that he has led us to. Okay, now, remember I called this message the five arts of intimacy. I'm going to actually relate this to the five arts of intimacy in marriage, and then we're going to have the kicker, the five arts of intimacy in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single one of the things I'm talking about right now in mining gold is going to parallel. Finding veins of gold isn't the end, it's the beginning, and if you don't do it, you don't have the next step. These, all, all these arts build on themselves. Mining the gold, gleaning the riches from the mine. You see, this is absolutely imperative. It's not just being in the mine. That isn't what causes you to have gold, just spending time. That isn't the key. That is one of them, but that one must collaborate with number two, which is to then study the mine and get to know what a vein looks like. Recognize glimmers. Recognize false glimmers from true glimmers where you begin to recognize authentic gold instead of fool's gold and falling for it. And you know where to spend your energies and you never waste a moment because you're a miner and you're good at mining. So mining the gold, gleaning the riches from the mine. I think every single one of us would agree that that's fairly important. Could you imagine leaving a big pile of gold in the mine and going out and everyone's like, so, uh, how'd the day go? Oh, I got some great gold. Where is your gold? I've actually never seen your gold. Oh, I just store it away in the mine. What's the good of gold hanging out in a mine? You gleaned that gold so that you could bring it into the open air. Bringing the beauty into the open air. Making it public. Make, sharing it with others around you. Have you seen this gold? This is the kind of gold I'm getting these days. Look at that. I mean, I got so much more down there. I can't wait to bring it out into the open and show the world how beautiful the gold is in Havel. And number five. Imagine if you have all this gold, but it still does not convert yet into the real world power that it should have. You see, when we link this to the spiritual life, you're going to recognize this, especially since we start our training in prayer tomorrow morning at 5.30 in the morning. Isn't that fun? But the, co- the commerce in heaven, we utilize, if you will, our commodity to gain access and to purchase, if you will, the things of heaven, is faith. It is a tried and proven faith. And we do it through prayer. It's like a commercial activity, if you will. I don't want to degradate it by calling it that. But it's like, I have faith, you have promises. I take my faith 
and I spend it on those promises. And guess what? If it's a tried, proven faith, those promises then come to this earth. It's a transaction of a spiritual nature. The same is true with a gold mine. If you just store up your gold and you have a whole pile of it, but you never take it into the marketplace and gain its true value in return. Remember how I said the result of this is what this message is after? You can have the gift, you can have the promise, you can have the commission, but now you must act upon it and take glorious possibilities and turn them into heavenly realities. You want intimacy? You want the results of that gold mine to actually be felt in your real life living? Well, guess what? You need five arts of gold mining. Wield its power in the marketplace. I got a piece of gold here, what's that worth to you? You have a commodity. And the same is true, as you will see, in all other forms of intimacy. And then you cash that in for something of real world value. Sacred results. The outcome is real and tangible, not theoretical. You see, if you have a gold mine, it's not just that you have a gold mine, you can brag to people that you have a gold mine and that you spend time in your gold mine or that you've seen some veins of gold in your gold mine. You see, if your gold mine is not producing a real world effect in your life, which is then financing your entire mission and operation, then you are not gaining the results that God intended you to gain. God does not play games with us. He's not interested in just holding us in contempt and saying, hey, look, I've given you this high calling, but you sure are stinking it up. You're not fulfilling it. And then he chuckles to himself as if they really could. Yeah, we can't outside the gold mine. We don't have the, the faculty to be able to pull off this impossible commission. But that's why he has supplied us with the gift. That is why he has given us the promise. And that is why he has spoken to us the commission. And he expects us to take advantage of that great glorious possibility and turn it and transform it into a very real reality in this earth. The dangers of picking and choosing our arts. Now, I've sort of already gone through this, but if you throw out the inconvenient duties requisite for mining Havel or gold, then you end up only with glorious possibilities and never with heavenly realities. How many of us, I just want you to weigh your soul today, how many of us have glorious possibilities in our life, but we have not specialized in heavenly realities? Christianity is theoretical, it's not practical. When we talk about a joy that is full, when we talk about a peace that passes all understanding, we talk about a love that when struck in one cheek, you can turn the other also. When we talk about false accusation and leaps for joy as a result. I don't care about the possibilities. If we're not activating these things with realities, what's the use? What's the good of having a gold mine if you're not getting the gold out of it? Where are you at? Some of us could say, I'm sick and tired of possibilities. I want realities. I don't blame you. How miserable would it be to have a gold mine for 30 years and never get one chunk out of it? Meanwhile, your family's starving, your marriage is drying up because you can't supply for your home, and there it is, the great inheritance that you always bragged about to other people. I got an inheritance. Yeah, well, your life isn't proving it, bucko. Something's missing. You have the gift, the promise, and the commission, but it's not translating into sacred results. You can have a great love story, but you need a great marriage. You can have the right framework for how you're going to raise your kids. That doesn't mean they're going to turn out well. You can have all the good intentions in the world for seeking after Jesus Christ and knowing him, but that doesn't mean a slam dunk answer of, yeah, you're a triumphant Christian. We have the gift, we have the promise, and we have the commission. What we need are the five arts. We need to know how to get out of those glorious possibilities, those heavenly realities. I'm going to skip over this because what I was going to do is just go through and say, if you had just one of those things and you don't have the others, do you really have? I mean, for instance, you cannot bring, something, bring beauty into the open air if you do not have the actual substance. Yet how many of us go out on the streets and try and communicate the gospel with someone when we ourselves have not yet seen the gold? 
How do you evangelize your Havilah gold mine and say you have a Havilah gold mine too? If you have not yet gotten any of the rock out of it. It's sort of difficult and you feel sort of awkward doing it. Oh, and the gold is so beautiful, they tell me. No, you tell them how beautiful it is because you have witnessed it personally. We don't borrow experiences from other people. If you have not seen the glory of the cross of Christ, don't borrow someone else's vision of it and say, oh, they saw it and they said it was beautiful. Then you go out and tell someone else about the beautiful vision they had. What you say is, God, I must see it myself. He says, I've given you the gold mine. Here's the deed. Here's the promise. Here's the, com the commission. Go, find it for yourself. It's available to us. We have access to the glory, to the mother load, in this case, the father load. It's available to us. The book that was never written. You know when, uh, let's see, how many years ago was this? Five? Five years ago? Five years ago, I sat down to write a book. I was under contract with Harvest House Publishers. I had one book left in my contract, and we had agreed that it was going to be a book called The Five Arts of Intimacy. I sat down and labored for multiple days over that book and had one thing ringing in my soul. I could not get past it. I remember I came down, sat down with Leslie. I had like a page or two of notes on a completely different topic. And I read it to Leslie, and she said, yeah, you need to write that book. It was a different book than The Five Arts of Innocence. You need to write that book, and when you write it, write it like a man. It's called The Bravehearted Gospel. I wrote The Bravehearted Gospel instead of this book. And so it is interesting that now five years later, I haven't talked on it since that I can remember, and here it is. And so I wanted to give you a little background that this has been a very deep theme in my life for years. And yet, there has been a restraint on this message, I guess you could say, until this week. Not purposeful, not that I had been pondering it. It's just that that's what God brought up this week. The book that was never written. Warming at the fire. So if I'm going to give you a little brief synopsis of what the book was going to be, when intimacy is dependent upon something other than Jesus Christ. For instance, a lot of us will go to a conference, a summer camp, an Ellerslie, and we'll see a fire raging there. And so we'll warm to the fire. And we'll be like, oh, as long as I'm around the fire, I have strength and I feel close to God. And so what happens is instead of recognizing that actually that fire is merely a result of Jesus Christ. In fact, the fire is Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ is portable. We end up needing something outside of ourselves with which to feel warm and close to God. And as a result, we struggle in intimacy because we have our highs and we have our lows and we justify that. We're like, well, this is when I was close and I was at that conference. And yes, and this is when I left the conference. That's just as what happens. Summer camp highs and then you fall away. And then that's why you go back to summer camp and then you fall away. By the way, that is not a pattern as demonstrated in scripture because God is who we fix to. He's our rock and we build upon him. And in him is no shadow of turning. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not go up and down. Just watch him. He's the same, always. His nature doesn't alter. His attitude, you know, he just is not like, just gets rude and mean one day and then has to ask forgiveness the next. He's the same God. And yet, what do our circumstances do? Our circumstances go all over the place. So when you follow your circumstances, sure, you'll be all over the place. You'll go up and down. But we don't follow circumstances. We follow Jesus Christ. And so as a result, we are not different people day in and day out. We are like Jesus day in and day out. That's what Christianity is. And so warming at the fire, this is the concept of us having a mentality that has to be busted open. Because what God wants to teach us is that, hey, you know that fire? That fire is supposed to be burning inside of you. It's not supposed to just be burning here at Ellerslie, then you come up and warm yourself at it. But that very fire is supposed to be in you. And then guess what? If you go this way, it goes with you. If you go this way, guess what? The fire just went with you. Wherever you go in this entire earth, guess what? Fire goes too. However, you have to know how to tend fire. You have to know how to keep it stoked. You have to know how to supply it with that which keeps it burning. And those are the five arts of intimacy. 
That's what the book was going to be about. Yearning for sacred sweetness. Two ways to pass the siren coastline. I, Leslie and I have written on the issues of relationships, romance, marriage, sexuality, manhood, femininity, for years. I think we have around 12 books dedicated specifically just to that theme. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about that theme, a lot of time cultivating that theme and our understanding of that theme. I would say in a very simple enunciation of this, because this isn't what this message is supposed to be about, but there is a huge desire in a crowd like this for success in their relationships with their spouse. Like for instance, those of you that are single, if I were to say so, on a, you know, sort of a measuring scale, like if, if you were to put a little monitor up to it, it's like, dee 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 What is the measure of desire that you have for having a great, world-class, intimate marriage? And I hold out the machine, it's like, dee 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 It's like this, you know, warning zone. Yeah, you guys have, the, yeah, it breaks the system. I'm like, and smoke starts coming out. I'm like, what do you do to my machine? There's a huge desire in a crowd like this. For those of you that are married, this is an interesting question. How many of you, now, you almost need to be separated from your spouse for this question because your spouse can give you that one look in a message like this, like, I've been talking to you about this. <laughs> don't, don't give that look while we're, while we're doing this. But how many of you desire intimacy in your marriage? I mean, if you could get past some of the awkwardness, some of those layers that have built up, and you really just desire to have no hindrance and a full confidence and a true connectedness. Wouldn't it feel awkward to say, yeah, I don't want that. No, we do. We want this. We yearn for this. But how we go about it is the reason why we're struggling for it. It's not that we don't want it. It's that we don't know how to get it. Yearning for the sacred sweetness. In this case, intimacy is the sacred sweetness. Now, if you've ever read When God Writes Your Love Story, I have a little story in there about Ulysses and Orpheus. So this is, uh, goes back to a little Greek mythology here. Two ways to pass the Siren coastline. This is legendary coastline. And any ship that would ever pass it of red-blooded men could not go past the Siren coastline without crashing into the shoreline. You could say, what's wrong with these men? Well, it's not just the coastline itself that's attractive. In fact, if that was the issue, they'd be able to bypass it very simply because they're good navigators with their ships. However, on this coastline is a group of sirens, beautiful women, sort of like mermaids, and they have a song that they sing. And it doesn't seem to matter who it is that's going by this coastline. If it's a group of men, guess what? They hear the sound, huh? and then they have to get nearer to the sound. It's intoxicating to their soul, and they crash. And ship after ship after ship has been decimated and men lost upon this coastline. It's a horrible history. Ulysses hears about this, and Ulysses is one strong guy. I mean, Ulysses, his bow, no one in the kingdom could even bend. I mean, this guy is just massive. And he thinks, you know what? I'm gonna get past that siren coastline. That siren coastline can beat every other captain, but it will not beat me. Welcome to how many of us men handle our marriage. I'm going to do this right. I will figure this out. I know those other guys, they have no clue what they're doing. But they're not Ulysses. Ulysses will figure it out. Okay, so Ulysses has a strategy. I have to admit, it's pretty brilliant. He sticks beeswax into his ears. So he crams his ears full of beeswax. I'm sorry, that isn't what happened. He crammed beeswax into all of his uh, men's ears. He had himself tied to the mast because he wanted to hear the sound. He sort of wanted to hear what they all were hearing and to know why they were all failing, okay? So he wanted to hear the sound, but he didn't want to destroy his ship. And so he was tied to the mast and all his men had beeswax in their ears so they could not hear the siren sound. And you have to admit, that's a pretty brilliant strategy to get past the siren coastline. What's interesting is he had to tell his men not to untie him no matter what he said. Do not read my lips, because I may lose my sanity for a brief interlude. And so guess what? They're passing the siren coastline, and Ulysses, he's screaming at his men, threatening Cyclops feedings, unless they turn the ship towards the coastline. But all the men had vowed that they will not read his lips and they will not heed him no matter what he says. And guess what? They made it past the Siren coastline. The first ship maybe to ever do it. They did it. 
And guess what? Ask Ulysses how he's doing afterwards. They untie him and he, he falls over. <laughs> he's miserable. He never wants to pass this coastline again. But guess what? He made it. Sure, functionally, he made it. In every other regard, the guy is in absolute misery. See, if that was the end of the tale, we'd just sort of say, well, you know what? That's just the only way we can get past the Siren coastline. That's the only way we can accomplish this difficult task called living life on planet Earth with temptation everywhere. Tie ourselves to the mast. Stick beeswax in the ears. There's no other hope. Well, there is another story. And it is rather fascinating. The other story is there's another captain named Orpheus. For whatever reason, he never heard all the hoopla about this uh, the Siren Coastline, or maybe he heard it, but he just completely ignored it and didn't seem to think it was much of a big deal because his men didn't struggle the same way the other men did. But what was their secret? They were the same sort of men. What was the difference? What was their secret? Well, let's look inside the ship. As they are approaching the Siren Coastline, the men cheer. and say, the Siren Coastline, just up to the left, sir. And so Captain Orpheus smiles and winks and says, get my instrument. And so all the men are clamoring about and excited, patting each other on the back, like, finally, finally. And so Captain Orpheus, you know, unveils his instrument, and he plays a song for them that he'd written himself. All the men sit around at his feet, staring up at the master musician, the captain, and he plays for them a song. And guess what? Soon, the siren coastline is out of view. The siren sound is no longer heard. And the men passed the Siren coastline without an issue. Why? It's because they heard a sweeter song. You see, there's two songs. The world has a song, and God has a song. However, what we are listening to and what we're tuning our ears into will define how we go through this process. We all desire the sweetness, but many of us are looking to our own earthly salary to be able to pull off the impossible commission instead of turning to the gold mine itself, which in this case would be the sweeter song. Wanting nearness without the cross, desiring sacred results from fleshly actions. We are at enmity naturally with God Almighty because of our sin, because of our rebellion. There is a wall that blocks us from his presence. Our sinfulness our unbelief, our rebellion prohibits us from entering into the throne of grace. And so what many of us want to do is we desire the nearness, we desire the closeness, we desire the intimacy, but we want it on our terms. And yet, God has given us a gift, he's given us a promise, and he's given us a commission. And he says there's only one way to get that gold. There's only one way to get that nearness. And yet we spurn the gift and we say, but I can get gold somehow in my own strength to honor you, of course. Why? Because then we could get the glory. It could be our personal gold collection. It doesn't have to be thanks to God. We want nearness without the cross. The cross is what purchased us the opportunity to draw near. And so I want you to recognize, as we go through this, whether it's in marriage or whether it's with Jesus Christ, nearness is a result of the cross. He has made it possible, and it's not going to be you with your earthly salary, your Ulysses strength, that is going to be able to gain access to the intimacy with Jesus Christ or the intimacy with your spouse that you desire. Desiring sacred results from fleshly action. The five arts of intimacy. Boy, it took a long time to get here, didn't it? We've been building, building a case. So first, we're going to go through the wedding edition of the five arts of intimacy. I have two different editions for you, the wedding edition and the Jesus edition. Okay, we actually have real-world marriages here, which God intends to showcase the realities of a heavenly relationship that the church has with Jesus Christ. And so an earthly marriage, if it is a Christian marriage, actually should demonstrate a microcosm, a little small picture of heaven on earth. Isn't that an amazing thought? Most people would say, ah, marriage, hell on earth. What does Jesus say? Ah, marriage, heaven on earth. Isn't that amazing? Talk about an opposite vantage point. 
Heaven come to earth. So let's quickly evaluate all of our marriages. <clears throat> heaven come to earth. Now some of the single people in here are like, yeah, I'd have a heaven come to earth marriage. <laughs> it's not that easy, is it? Any of us that are married know that this doesn't, just doesn't come naturally because we long for it. It's just because we wake up one day and say, I esteem great marriage. And then poof, voila, there we have a great marriage. Any more than just saying, yeah, I have a deed to a gold mine. Sure, yeah. It has gold in it. All that gold is legally mine. Doesn't mean you have any of it. It's like, show me some of your gold. I'll get to that. Let me talk about my gold mine. You see, you can talk all day long, but until you actually mine that gold, that gold mine for its gold, until you actually spend the time in it and study and learn to find those veins of gold, until you actually labor to gain and extract that gold from the mine, and until you then bring it into the open air and then make it a commercial operation to gain the value out of what you've discovered. Well, guess what? You're a talker. You're all talking. This world doesn't actually believe you have a gold mine. They don't believe you really have something. You have to prove it in the real world realities. The wedding edition, five tools that make a marriage beautiful. Now, some of you in here that are married are thinking these single people are cheating right now. <laughs> what benefit could we have had in our lives to have these five tools from the beginning? Oh, cheaters. <laughs> However, guess what? I don't care what you call my kids. Call them cheaters all you want. I want to give them the good stuff from the beginning. I want them to go far beyond wherever I've been able to go. I do. I don't want them to go through the challenges that I've faced or that Leslie and I have had to face and just figuring out Christian marriage and figuring out how these triumphant truths integrate into real world human beings down here. So take, take advantage of this. Five tools that make a marriage beautiful. Number one, the art of solitude and stillness. Doesn't that sound like a strange thing? How's that going to make a marriage beautiful? Let me read the description for this. Basically, it's the concept of time. Time dedicated. That's the crucial dimension here. Time dedicated. You say, this is valuable. My spouse is important, so guess what? I am going to dedicate time to this. Time given time spent, time purposely directed is the principal attribute of a working, growing, and ever maturing love story. This time doesn't have to be filled with noise, with action, or with activity. This time doesn't need to be marked by some gain, some benefit, or some calculable benefit. It's like, what am I getting out of this? How is this helping me? That's not how you think. You see, stillness and solitude yeah, if you can translate this all the way over to your relationship with Jesus, you can see it. How about a mind? Remember we were talking about a mind? You come into a mind, you have to spend time in the mind. But it's not just spending time. It's what flows out of the givenness of time. You see, intimacy in a marriage demands that there is a givenness of time. And you can say, well, what am I getting out of the time? Hold your horses. You must give the time without any need for something back. You give it because of the value of the one you're giving it to. You're giving it because in that mine is gold. You're giving it because there's value there. Not because you automatically feel good because you're giving it. It's like, oh, I feel good down here giving this time in this mine. And so you're passing time going, oh, I feel good. Oh, that feels great spending time in the mine. No, that's probably not what you're going to be thinking. If you're looking for it to give some rush to you, you give time without any need for something given back to you. And how, guess what happens? It prepares you for art number two. So this says, this time doesn't need to be marked by some gain, some benefit, or some calculable benefit. It is a time, it is time that is fully offered and made available without need of even the slightest compensation that truly yields the greatest joy in intimacy. Number two, the art of intentional study. And do you remember what the gold miner had to do? The gold miner can't just pass time, you know, stick on some uh, clock or some alarm system. It's like, eh, eh, eh. All right, I'm done for the day. I'm clocking out. I spent my time in the gold mine. Could you imagine if that's what I did with Leslie? It's like, okay, uh, our counselor said that we need to spend 58 minutes together daily for a healthy marriage. I turn up, you know, the, the alarm thing or the, the timer, and I'm like pacing back and forth in the room, and Leslie's sitting there watching me, and then it's like, ding! I'm like, well... 
Our marriage is better. <laughs> Praise God. It actually didn't do anything to our marriage other than frustrate and infuriate my wife. Because I'm actually mocking the entire construct of relationship with that mentality. It's not how it works. It needs time dedicated and time spent, but not just time, purposeful time. Time that is given and then directed into the next art of intimacy, which is the art of intentional study. Remember, the miner has to look for gold. He has to learn how the veins of gold look. He has to be able to recognize truth from error. Study. The art of intentional study. We could call this affectionate observation. Great love is a result of great observation. But there are two ways to observe. One way is to observe with a critical eye, seeking fault, weakness, and frailty. The God way, however, is to observe with an eye for all that is lovely and lovable. Could you imagine if you're spending time in your gold mine and all you're looking for is fool's gold to get mad at your father for giving you a mine that had fool's gold in it? Well, if that's all you're looking for, you're going to miss the real gold. And how many of us do that? in our marriages, in our family relationships, with our kids, where we have a tendency to look for the fool's gold and what's wrong instead of what's lovely and lovable. Eh, makes all the difference in the world when it comes to what you're down there for. You see the fool's gold and you say no, and then you look for the right stuff. Your attention and your gaze and your fu fixation is on real gold. That's what you're after, lovely and lovable. So one way is to observe with a critical eye, seeking fault, weakness, and frailty. The God way, however, is to observe with an eye for all that is lovely and lovable. When a spouse studies their spouse with a desire to truly know them, understand them, appreciate them, and more effectively serve them, then that spouse will find that intimacy will find them. Intimacy will find you when you study for the lovely and the lovable. When you observe that which is praiseworthy, and guess what? Intimacy can't help but just bump into you. It's like, oh, hey, I'm intimacy. Oh, it's great to meet you. I've been looking for you. It finds you when you turn outward like this. A spouse that feels known, understood, and appreciated is a spouse that is open to closeness and to receiving expressions of affection. Number three, the art of loving meditation. This would be the equivalent of extracting gold. You don't just see the gold veins, but now you extract them. You dig for them. You gain that gold. We call this purposeful remembrance. Thoughtfulness is the spark plug of a great marriage. It is so easy to get distracted and forget the things that matter most. But when a spouse labors to remember all that is lovely and lovable about his or her spouse throughout the day, the stage is set for intimacy to thrive. A spouse that feels remembered, thought about, and considered is a deeply happy spouse. Now, what would it be like to study and see veins of gold and then forget where they are? Can you follow me on this to say thoughtfulness and remembrance is very critical. You see it, and then you reach for your tool, and then come out. It's like, where was it again? You see it. You see that which is lovely and lovable, and then you go after it to cherish it, to extricate it, to gain access fully to it. Number four, the art of ex affectionate expression. So, in this situation, I was talking about bringing the beauty into the light. That's the gold miner. Words of adoration. You've seen gold. Now you've meditated upon it. You've beheld it. You've extracted that vein. You've gained that chunk. Now what do you do? Could you imagine seeing something lovely and lovable in your spouse and then keeping it to yourself? What is required of us in intimacy is to share that which we've beheld. And what have we seen? We've seen how lovable and lovely they are. So what comes out? Words of adoration. When a spouse studies the one they love to discern everything lovely and lovable about them, and when they meditate and daily remember these precious qualities, words of adoration come naturally. When one beholds beauty, strength, and grandeur, there is never arm twisting required in order to get them to say, wow. Could you imagine if I had to come up to Leslie and say, you are beautiful. 
That would be awkward, wouldn't it? Could you imagine Les was like, thank you, wonderful. However, what if I behold that which is lovely and lovable? You know that someone doesn't, you don't need to come up to me and say, Eric, come on, you say it now. Say it, and I'm like, you're beautiful. It naturally elicits praise. The same way we used this illustration right in the beginning. When you see a glorious sunset, it elicits praise from your lips. Wow, is what you say. When you behold, when you meditate, when you see after you have studied, you gain it. Then you take it up into the light and you praise it. This is beautiful. This is lovely. A marriage that continually states wow is a marriage that will always thrive. Number five, the art of vulnerable communication. So all of this is building. You'll notice this is the progression of intimacy. This is how it is built. It must have time, but time alone isn't what creates it. It must have studiousness. It must study and observe that which is lovely and lovable, but in and of itself, that won't create intimacy because then you must meditate upon it. You must extract that beauty. You must take it and behold it and meditate upon it, which then turns into a love sonnet. It turns into a love poem. It turns into words of praise and encouragement, thoughtfulness, which says, I'm remembering you. This is what I see in you. And then the art of vulnerable communication. We could call this trusting openness. It takes a great deal for true trust to be established. But a marriage built on the first four of these five arts is one in which true trust can flourish. And this trust is a soil in which the depths of honesty, openness, and vulnerability can grow. It is in this soil that the most precious communications can take place, heart to heart, deep unto deep, spirit to spirit. And this is intimacy, heavenly intimacy. It's nearness and it's closeness. It's affectionate friendship. And it's the inmost being shared. But you cannot expect the inmost to be shared just because you're spending time. Just because you're in the same room together or on a date night. That does not translate into intimacy. We must have tools that God has entrusted us to be able to take the gold that is in our life, whether it's in our marriages, whether it's in our children, or in the spiritual sense, whether it's in Jesus Christ, and know how to bring out that gold and make it useful. All right, the Jesus edition. This is the five arts of intimacy, the Jesus edition. Five tools that keep the spiritual fires burning. Number one, the art of solitude and stillness. And what I've done under this is I have a parenthetical statement which shows the wedding edition version. Okay, and you'll notice that this is exactly the same. The art of solitude and stillness. You know that to cultivate the fire of relationship and intimacy with Jesus Christ, you need the exact same thing? Here at Ellerslie, we typically call it stillness, but we also have solitude. We have solitude and stillness. It's time. It's purposeful time set apart in our life to say, Jesus, I'm here. I'm here. Time dedicated. It's time given. It's time spent. It's time purposely directed is the principal attribute of a working, growing, and ever-maturing relationship with the king. Does this sound familiar? Yeah, that's because marriage is merely an offshoot. It's a demonstration. It's a picture of the relationship we have with our king. This time doesn't have to be filled with noise, with action, or with activity, though we oftentimes feel it has to. We have to make noise. We have to do something because just sitting here and being still in God's presence, eh, that's not doing anything. This time doesn't need to be marked by some gain, some benefit, or some calculable uh, benefit. There's the word benefit twice. It is time that is fully offered and made available without need of even the slightest compensation that truly yields the greatest joy in intimacy. Number two, the art of biblical study. Now look what it was for marriage, the art of intentional study, where you're looking for the veins. Well, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, did you know that he has given us a mine? Now you could call the word of God the Havilah gold mine, and it would be an accurate statement. However, the truest sense is the word of God made flesh. It's Jesus Christ. But we can get to know the word of God made flesh in and through the gold mine of Scripture. And so as we go into it, I mean, literally there's gold everywhere. However, have you ever gone to the word of God and it feels dry? It feels like it, it doesn't have that zest? What should you do? Close the word of God and say, yeah, there's no more gold here. There's gold there, but you must pursue it. And study or intentional study of the Word of God is literally one of the arts that cultivates intimacy with Jesus Christ. 
affectionate observation and pursuit. Great love for Christ is a result of great observation and pursuit of Jesus Christ in his revealed word. But there are two ways to observe his word. One way is to observe with a critical eye, seeking fault and weakness and frailty. How many people in our generation do exactly that? They're looking for fault in the word of God. Well, that's like coming to your spouse and looking for fool's gold in them. You know what? It's not going to prosper any sort of intimacy with your spouse, and this is not going to prosper any sort of intimacy with Jesus Christ. One way is to observe with a critical eye, seeking fault, weakness, and frailty. The God way, however, is to observe with an eye for all that is lovely and lovable. When a Christian studies the King of Kings with a desire to truly know him, understand him, and appreciate him, and more effectively serve him, then the Christian will find that intimacy with Christ will find them. As it says in Jeremiah, and ye shall seek him and find him, and it says me in the actual translation, but I turn it to him because it fits in this context. You shall seek him and find him when you shall search for him with all your heart. Are you seeking with all your heart? Are you all in? Is this something you're really after? Prove it. Do you believe that there's gold there? Prove it. Look for it. Go after it. Study. Number three, the art of biblical meditation. We call in the, the wedding version was the art of loving meditation. We call this purposeful remembrance. Thoughtfulness is the is the spark plug of a great Christian life. It is so easy to get distracted and forget the things that matter most. But when a Christian labors to remember all that is lovely and lovable about Jesus Christ throughout the day, the stage is set for spiritual intimacy to thrive. When a Christian thinks on the Word of God throughout the day, then the person of Jesus Christ will be paramount in their life. Things that are lovely, noble, pure, and of good report will be the substance of their thoughts, and closeness to Christ will be a natural byproduct. You see, when you are given the proper tools, when you're trained as a minor, then you recognize there's a gift given. There's a promise given with that gift, and there's a commission that is given with that promise and with that gift. And so as a result, we are then trained as minors. We must dedicate time to this mind. This mind needs to be a focal point of our life where we literally give of ourselves daily, but not just to spend time there, to spend time observing there, but not to just spend time and observe there, but to spend time observe, and then when we find, we dig. And not just to dig and create a little pile of gold all for ourselves, but then to bring that gold out into the light and to share its beauty. And not just to have the gold chunks out in the light, but then to make use of them so that this world is altered because of the strength and the wealth and the virtue of those gold nuggets. Number four, the art of heartfelt worship. In historic Christianity, the concept is this. You spend time with God, and then you begin to observe God. You begin to know him more. You begin to understand his ways. And then you meditate upon all the gold that he's given you. And he'll give you something each week. This is how I prepare my sermons. Each week, he gives me a vein of gold. And that's the vein that I go after. And that's where a sermon comes from, which is what, I, what am I doing? I'm bringing it into the light. And then we worship God when we behold him. You see, if I forced you to sing and say nice things about a sunset that you haven't seen, it's sort of awkward, isn't it? It's a, it's a beautiful sunset. Raise your hands now. It's a beautiful sunset. Yeah, that's, that's not appropriate worship. Worship is supposed to flow out of meditation. Meditation is beholding that which you have seen and witnessed and observed and excavated. I have this. And then you can't help but say, wow, have you seen how beautiful this gold is? No one's twisting your arm. No one's forcing you to say it. It comes out as natural course. Okay? That's what worship is supposed to come out of. Same in your relationship with your spouse. Where does it come out of? It comes out of beholding that which is lovely and lovable. Well, how does it work with Jesus Christ? Beholding that which is lovely and lovable. When you behold it, when you see it, you can't help but sing it, declare it, share it. Have you seen the gold that my God has given to me? By the way, he has a mind for you too. The art of heartfelt worship. This was known as the art of affectionate expression. Words of adoration. When a Christian studies Jesus Christ and meditates daily upon his preciousness, words of adoration and praise come naturally. When a Christian beholds Christ's beauty, strength, and grandeur, there is never arm twisting required in order to get them to shout, wow. A Christianity that continually proclaims wow is a Christianity that will always thrive. Number five, the art of prayer. 
also known in the wedding edition as the art of vulnerable communication. When you have a deep and intimate trust and a confidence in the one you are coming to, what comes out? You share the inmost. And for us, we share the inmost, and guess what's living at the inmost? The Spirit of God, and He gives us prayers. And we begin to share the depths deep unto deep, and we have intimacy with the Most High God. Prayer is literally, a healthy prayer life is one of the number one signs of an intimate love relationship with Jesus Christ. Trusting openness, faith and unshakable confidence is the bulwark of a working relationship with God. A Christianity built on the first four of these five arts is one in which true faith can flourish. And this faith is a soil in which the depths of honesty, openness, and vulnerability can grow. It is in this soil that the most precious communications can take place. The most precious prayer life can prosper. Heart to heart, deep unto deep, spirit to spirit. And this is intimacy, heavenly intimacy. Mining for Havila gold. I'm going to actually skip over this. This is the, the combination of all three. So we had time dedicated inside the mind, which then translated into the art of solitude and stillness, the art of solitude and stillness. In other words, this is the three. You have the mind, then you have the marriage, and then you have the relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what you'd see is that all five of these, that's what it was. So the mind was time dedicated inside the mind, finding the veins of gold, mining the gold, gleaning the riches from the mind, bringing the beauty into the open air, and wielding its power in the marketplace. We as Christians gain the gold that tried true faith that has been found in and through the fires of intimacy. And then we bring with that faith and that confidence into the heavenly realms and we say, you know those promises that you have, the what you've accomplished on that cross? We need them down here, Lord Jesus. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's prayer. It's the depths of intimacy. The marriage pop quiz. 11 attributes of the heavenly spouse. Now, I didn't give you any preparation for this, and unfortunately, this isn't just a men's conference. Men's conferences are a little easier for these types of pop quizzes because the men's, men don't have the sharp elbow of their wife next to them going, Hoof. and so I do want uh, you to offer grace one unto the other because the list I'm about to give you is so outrageously righteous that it showcases our unrighteousness, where we are not polished. And I just want you to know from the beginning, I do not pretend to be the finished product on this list. I esteem it with every fiber of my being, and I want to be this unto my wife. But I tell you what, there is need for more of Jesus in Eric Ludi. So this is a pop quiz. I want us to be honest in our souls. We don't have to yell out our answer like, I stink at that one. Uh, you, we don't need to hear that. Uh, all right, the marriage pop quiz, 11 attributes of the heavenly spouse. Number one, that spouse must be an advocate. We could call it the defender. Number two, the fan. They are inordinately biased in your favor. No matter what is said about you, oh, they don't believe that if it's negative. And if they see any positive, they'll overlook all your negatives. And they'll say, oh, I have the best spouse on earth. Uh-huh. Number three, the boaster, the talker-upper. Uh, have you seen my spouse? My spouse is far more beautiful than yours. <laughs> They're the boaster. All they want to talk about is how wonderful their spouse is. Number four, the partner, the helper. Something needs to be done, look no further than your spouse. In other words, you are the first available one. You are the one with the resources and the energy. Where are you going to give them? There, to your spouse, first. Number five, the student, you are the expert and the PhD on your spouse. You are the earth's resident expert on your spouse. Any questions, they come to you. You know everything about your spouse. You study them for a living. Number six, the friend, the loyal no matter what. I don't care how bad it gets, whether living in uh, riches or in poverty, whether in sickness or in health, makes no difference. You're the friend, and you're loyal no matter what. They must know this. Number seven, the counselor, the bringer of truth and perspective. Every single one of us knows that these are things that every marriage must have. And we've had our moments. Some of you could say, I I've been that before. No, I'm saying this is the way a spouse is always. Why? How can I say that so confidently? Because this is Jesus. Have you seen this list? 
This is Jesus. And you know that he doesn't change, he doesn't alter, he doesn't have his bad days and his good days. You know that this is who he is? Who lives in us as Christians? Mm -hmm. Mystery hidden for ages and generations, but has now been revealed. Christ. Whoa. That lives in us. So that we can be unto those in our life that which Christ is. Now, we must be in agreement with this. But this is what we have. We have a gold mine available to us. Number eight, the encourager. The one who always sees the silver lining. Things can be down, but guess what? What's a spouse there for? Oh, look what God will do through this. He's going to turn this. No, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on him right now. There's always a silver lining. We can call it the Pollyanna. <laughs> always. There's a happy turn in every situation. How do we know that? Because Jesus is on the throne. And so we're encouragers. The thoughtful, the considerate gift giver. I wish I was a better gift giver. My gifts aren't that good. Probably the best gift I've ever given to Leslie was I went to the store on a whim once, because I don't do things spontaneously very often, and I got her, what was it, some licorice, some panda licorice, and a couple other things. I put them in a bag, and it showed that I'd studied her. That's the reason she liked it. It was like the cheapest gift I'd ever given her. But it's like she, I knew all the things that she loved. And so I went through the store, walked through, because I had no other time to go. So I went through the grocery store and found the things in the store that she loved. And she enjoyed that gift. It was the thoughtfulness that spoke the volumes. But if I could be more thoughtful, things would go great. Number 10, the affectionate, the intimate, a.k.a. the lover. It's not just the helper and the friend it's also the one who is willing to get near, to get close. See, I'm a friend with you guys in here, and I could be a helper to you. There's a lot of things I can be, but I'm not going to be the lover. <laughs> this is a unique dimension to a marriage, and it's necessary. It's necessary for that strength to prosper. Number 11, the empathizer, the sharer of sufferings. Leslie is a lot better than I am at being a nurse. I don't know if any of you guys have ever run in this, but I, I don't accept sickness, but I, when I used to get sick, uh, I had to get my cold once a year, you know, whether it's a headache or a fever or something. There was part of me that sort of enjoyed it because I had Leslie who would nurse me. And I tell you what, I love being nursed. Now, when poor Leslie ever has a, an issue, I'm like, so what's going on? You all right? Oh, you want me to pray for you? I mean, I'll do something, but it's not like I have that nurse quality. Like, oh, oh, let me get you a hot rag. She goes, you can get me a hot rag. I'm like, oh, or a cold rag, I think is what she needs. A cold rag, <laughs> then I get the hot one. It's probably exactly what I do. <laughs> so she almost has to tell me, I don't think like a nurse. That's not the way I function. I think like a boot camp drill sergeant. <laughs> All right, let's get up. Give me 10. We're going to prove that you're not really sick. <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, the way I can be. <laughs> the empathizer, the sharer of sufferings. The heavenly husband. All right? Now you're going to recognize this is my meditation this week. And this is one intense meditation because our heavenly husband is all those things. And I'm going to read the list of Jesus taking a man as a husband and exemplifying his nature in and through us as men. Whew. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Is there precedent for what I'm about to say? You better believe it. We are called to love our wives, even as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? Well, he gave himself for it. He suffered. He died. He condescended to the lowest position, became obedient unto death. Wow. And that's the commission to us as men and how we are to love our wives. Let thy fountain be blessed, speaking to men, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth, and be thou ravished always with her love. Isn't that an amazing statement? That's a command. The impossible commission, the one that every single Christian, and the one that every single Christian husband ought to carry out, 
in the grace of the Almighty. So what I'm about to lay out is impossible. I'll be the first one to acknowledge it. And yet, we have no excuse. It's sort of like saying, God, I can't afford to carry out this assignment you've given me. And he says, that's why I gave you the gold mine. I know you can't carry it out, but that's why I gave you the gold mine. How you handle the gold mine defines if you're able to carry out the commission. The commission is impossible for your earthly salary. You can't do it. But he's given you everything you need for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. The advocate. This is going to be the same 11 things. I'm just going to read through them from the angle of a husband and just declare. My wife needs to know, the advocate, the defender. My wife needs to know that I will stand for her, protect her physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I will be the first sufferer. As Jesus stood in the gap for me, it is my great privilege to give up my life for my beloved. Nothing touches my bride. Number two, the fan, the biased. I am incurably biased in favor of my wife. She is the most precious, most beautiful, most talented, most virtuous, most everything else that matters woman that ever existed. I am her biggest fan and I can't help but brag about her marvelousness. You go, girl. <laughs> Number three, the boaster, the talker upper. I am blind to my wife's weaknesses. Just think about God with us, the heavenly husband. And that one line should speak volumes to you. If I focus on my wife's weaknesses, I'm not demonstrating Jesus Christ. I need to be the boaster. I am blind to my wife's weaknesses. As far as I'm concerned, she doesn't have weaknesses. In fact, I can only see that which ought to be praised. I am her self-appointed bragger. I'm her built-in PR department. Have you seen my wife? She's simply amazing. Number four, the partner, the helper. If my wife needs a hand, look no further than my own. In fact, take my hand, take my other hand. My right and left legs, my back, and my two shoulders too. Put your burdens on me, dear wife. I'm built strong so that I can serve you. If a baby is crying, let me go help them. If a room needs to be picked up, you stay seated and let me get it cleaned up. If a dish needs to be scrubbed, I'm on it. We are in this thing together. Number five, the student, the expert, the PhD. If there is something to know about my wife, then I'm going to make sure I know it. I desire to be Earth's resident expert on my wife. I must know her longings, her dreams, her fears, and her insecurities. And I don't just know my wife for the sake of gaining random trivial data, but for the sake of serving her better as a husband. Number six, the friend, the loyal no matter what. If hard times come, I will still be here. If accusations come against you, I know the truth. If you lose your health, I'll remain by your side. If you lose your physical beauty, my devotion to you will not wane in the least. I am here always and forever, and I consider it my great privilege to call you my dearest friend. Number seven, the counselor, the bringer of truth and perspective. When my wife is struggling to see straight, it is my privilege to be the one ready to supply God's word. When shadow sweeps across our living room, it is my opportunity to turn on the light of scripture. When anxiety knocks, I must hit it in the teeth. When foreboding baits, I must strike hard and fast with the sword of truth. When false accusation, mockery, and lies fill the airwaves, it is my privilege to trump them with the power of a heavenly perspective. Number eight, the encourager, the one who always sees the silver lining. No matter what, I have words of life for my wife. I must never be the source of anxiety or depression, but rather the source of life. Even in the darkest hour, I must see the victory of Jesus. And I must labor to fill her mind with thoughts that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, virtuous, praiseworthy, and of good report. Number nine, the thoughtful. The considerate, the gift giver. I must labor to keep my wife always in my mind's eye. I must think about how she can be strengthened, encouraged, blessed, and built stronger. I must think of special, meaningful ways to express my adoration, my respect, and my love. And I mustn't skimp on these expressions. Now, I don't know if you're linking this with how the heavenly husband works with you. Some of you might glaze over and say, well, I'm not married. Maybe one day when I get married, I'll listen to this message again. I want you to recognize everything we're talking about is how Jesus Christ relates with us. He keeps us in his mind's eye. You know the gifts that he gives, the expressions of love he gives to us? Look at this last line, and I mustn't skimp 
on these expressions. I can tell you one who does not skimp on his expressions to us. Let us learn from him and let us allow this great heavenly expressor of love to express love in and through us. Number 10, the affectionate, the intimate, the lover. I must be the sort of husband that is trustworthy with my wife's innermost feelings, thoughts, and concerns. I must be trustworthy up close to handle her heart with the utmost care, to handle her inmost person with heavenly delicacy and softness. I must be the man she wants to love and be near, and not the man she just is supposed to love and be near. I'm going to read that last line again. Because a lot of us as men try and hold it over our wife and say, hey, you're supposed to love me and be near me. Listen to this last line. I must be the man she wants to love and be near, not the man she is just supposed to love and be near. If you're going to be the sort of husband that Jesus Christ could say, yeah, yeah, that's the way to do it. We must pursue this sort of love. Number 11, the empathizer, the share of sufferings. When my wife is hit with any difficulty, tribulation, or trial, I will carry it with her. And if at all possible, for her. I feel her pain because her pain is my pain. Her heartache is my heartache. Her concerns are my concerns. And her sufferings are my sufferings. You see Jesus? Hmm. The impossibility of intimacy. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Well, the answer is clear in Scripture. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. How many of us can ascend the hill of the Lord outside of Jesus Christ? The impossibility of intimacy. What we long for, we cannot have. You know that most people on earth do not believe that a true, intimate love story in the natural realm between a man and a wife is even possible? They've never seen it, never conceived of it. We in this room at least have a glimpse. We know that it should be possible. We just may not have it yet. How many of us understand the glory and the beauty of what has been made available to us in the cross? Because it is truly impossible for us to get that which has been made possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. The passion for intimacy. And he arose and came to his father. This is the prodigal son who has gone away and rebelled and misspent the gold mine, if you will. He has lavished the world's goods upon his own pleasures. How many of us have misspent the gift, mishandled the promise, and totally ignored the commission? And yet, where is the father in this story? And he arose and came to his father. The prodigal has arisen. And he's decided, I'm coming back to my father, and it's better to be a slave or a servant in my father's house than to be eating with the pigs. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. His father's looking for him, longing for him, and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Most of us, when we look at this, are like, God, I want to be near. Well, he wants to be nearer than you desire to be near to him. He is the one watching. He is looking to draw you near. He initiated the nearness. He's the one that wants it. You're like, God, I've really wanted this for years. Well, he's wanted it since the beginning. You're not going to have any resistance on his part. He wants intimacy. It's his desire. The provision for intimacy. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw near unto God. I know that's an awkward grammatical statement, but basically it's saying the law couldn't draw us into that intimacy. We couldn't get into the presence through our own righteousness. Our paycheck didn't cut it. But there's a better hope that did. A better hope, by the way, is Jesus Christ. By the which, by the which, Jesus Christ we draw near unto God. Intimacy, drawing near with perfect confidence. You guys remember that slide from earlier? That's the very first slide we clicked on outside the title. Drawing near with perfect confidence. Remember these three things? Nearness, closeness, admission into the sacred and otherwise prohibited territory. I want you to think spiritually now. Everything that we're talking about applies to natural realm relationships 
and supernatural realm relationships. Everything. It's all the same. Relationship is a picture of the heavenlies. And Christ has done what was needed to break the barrier and the partition that is hindering us here on earth and that which is hindering us in the heavenlies. He has set relationships right. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. He's given it to us. Nearness, closeness, admission into the sacred and otherwise prohibited territory. You cannot come near to the throne of grace. But that's where the help is for time in time of need. And yet you're prohibited from coming in. Gentile dogs is what we are. We're unclean and only that which is clean is allowed in. We're sunk. It's called bad news. However, there's one who desired intimacy with us. We always try and take the credit. Yeah, I'm after intimacy with Jesus. He is after intimacy with us. For God so wanted an intimacy with us that he gave up his only son that whosoever would believe in him should have that intimacy. That's the gospel. He brings us near by the blood of Jesus. Affectionate friendship, the healing of all hurts. I don't care what you've done, it's healed. The removal of all impediment, it's gone. The complete restoration of all trust, no barrier, no restriction, no wall of separation. Sharing the inmost, revealing that which is inward innermost. Now let's break this into Jesus Christ. Celebrating the work of the cross, for it has brought us near unto our God. Nearness, closeness, admission to the sacred, otherwise prohibited territory. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This word boldly is used multiple times in the book of Hebrews to describe our entrance and our attitude in which we come near. We have no business coming near, but don't we recognize that the blood of Jesus now clothes us, which then gives us access? It has removed all hindrance. All of that is gone. Hasn't anyone ever told you? There's now no hindrance to you coming in because you are clothed in the blood of Christ. Come near and come boldly. But that's the holy of holies. People are struck dead in the holy of holies. Come boldly. Jesus has done the work. There is now no partition. There is no barrier. You are brought near, near by the blood of Jesus. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Do you see that? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Remember the definition. Approaching, coming near with full confidence. Let us, have, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. There's gold in that mine. He promised. He gave us the gift, and he's promised. He, for he is faithful that promised. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father unto the intimate place of father-child relationship, we have access in and through Jesus Christ, in whom, speaking of Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Affectionate friendship, the healing of all hurts, the removal of all impediment, the complete restoration of a trust, no barrier, no restriction, no wall of separation. For he is our peace, speaking of Jesus, who has made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In whom, now let's go back to that for a second. I want you to think about the marriages in here. There's a, oftentimes a wall of partition that can be built up. I want you to recognize who is the one that tears down that wall. It's Jesus. We need Jesus. We need Jesus to succeed in our love stories. We need Jesus to succeed in our heavenly love story. Let's just get down to brass tacks. We need Jesus. We can't do this in our own earthly income. 
We need the gold mine. We need the gift. We need his promise. And we must heed the commission. We must enter into that mine. Seek it. Study it. Know it. Mine it. Bring it out into the light. We must take full advantage of the wealth that Jesus Christ has made available in and through his cross work. In whom, speaking of Jesus, also are you circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That old life, that old barrier between you is cut off. It's circumcised. It's removed. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. There's all sorts of reasons you can't come near. It's a whole system of law. Hold, uh, what, what, did it, what did it call it? It said the handwriting of ordinances. We have all the handwriting of ordinances that hinders and what does Jesus do? He took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Come near. Come near. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Remember what intimacy is? It's taking the deep things and sharing them. You see, he says, you're not just servants. But I'm saying I want to share the deep things with you. The things that the Father has made known unto me in my innermost, I want to share it. Now look at this last one. Sharing the inmost. Revealing that which is inner, inward, innermost. Did Jesus do this for us? Think about it. Listen to these scriptures. First of all, look at that last scripture I had. All things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So there's one evidence of it. Now look at this one. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. This is right at the cross. He's just about to die. Look what it says. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The most precious thing he has. This is, you could call this the gold mine, the deed, the gift. Look what the word gave up is. Paradidome. To give into the hands of another, to give over into one's power or use, to deliver to one something to keep use, take care of manage. My dear son Eric, here is the deed to the Havila gold mine. It is yours, 100% yours. Jesus gave us everything. He deeded it to us. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forwith came there out blood and water. Remember what Jesus says at the Feast of Tabernacles? He says, those that believe in me, out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his innermost, the word belly is innermost, out of his innermost came a river. And that river has watered our lives and has made us fruitful. And it has flowed through the land of Havilah, where the gold is good. We have the privilege of accessing something that we have no business accessing because of his work. You know that our marriages can be heaven on earth because of his work, not because of our Ulysses strength? You might as well just accept it now. You cannot have a great marriage outside of Jesus Christ. You cannot access the throne room of grace for help in time of need outside of Jesus Christ. There is only one way to the Father, and there's only one way to a great marriage. Jesus. The secret to intimacy with God. I know this is a shocker. Jesus. By the way, I can support that all throughout Scripture. There's only one way to nearness. The method by which he offered intimacy, the cross. The secret to intimacy with your spouse. This is a shocker, I know. Jesus. The method by which he offered intimacy. The cross. But it is good for me to draw near to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And it came to pass, I love this, and it came to pass that while they communed together, this is the, on the road to Emmaus, two of the disciples, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. 
I love that. Jesus himself drew near. Let's pray.